I hope you'll forgive me for reminding you of the principal thesis of the lecture I gave yesterday. I argued then that G.E. Moore overthrew naturalism by the rather odd way of showing that the property, good in itself, cannot be defined. Now, I tried to show why, despite all appearances, this did overthrow naturalism or the naturalism of Moore's day. You see, the naturalism of Moore's day consisted in saying you can define the property good in itself in terms of some natural property, like pleasant or like being the object of an interest or something of that sort. And in consequence, those who put forward the naturalist theories Moore knew about simply couldn't face Moore's challenge, which was, <clears throat> is the question whether a thing that has one of the properties uh, in terms of which good in itself is defined, <clears throat> is uh, a thing which has that property good in itself, and then ask, is that question a significant question or a merely vacuous one? Remember, Moore said, if a certain property, F, say, is a good definition of goodness, then the question, so-and-so is F, but is it good, must be a vacuous question. And, of course, we just about never will admit that such a question is vacuous. So, by this curious logical argument, Moore said you can never define good, and since naturalists, or the naturalists of his day, all wanted to define it, the naturalists of his day were reduced to evasions, and, in consequence, their theory lost its hold on people. <coughs> now, the theory that Moore replaced naturalism by was a very simple one. It was the doctrine that good is a simple non-natural property, and that you simply perceive that various kinds of things uh, have this property, goodness, by a sort of intellectual intuition. Now, Moore's theory, I went on to argue, is a completely unstable one. And the reason why it's unstable is this. If no natural property, and moreover no metaphysical or theological property, is identical with good in itself, what sort of property can good in itself be? Now, in his main book, Principia Ethica, Moore could not answer that question at all satisfactorily. However, in a late essay, he proposed this answer. He said, all properties other than the pure ethical properties are properties which are properly mentioned in a description of a thing. But the pure ethical properties are not to be mentioned in a full description of a thing. They, as it were, are non-descriptive. Now, I argued that this answer, which logically is quite all right, is ethically disastrous, because what it leads to is the doctrine that uh, properties like good are simply not substantial or have no content. After all, if you say it doesn't add anything to the description of a thing, to say that it's good, then you might well feel that the goodness of a thing is no real or substantial part of it. And I argued that was the conclusion which Moore's followers uh, and people who respected him very much, the logical positivists drew. If you look at the uh, famous Language, Truth and Logic by A.J. Eyre, or C.L. Stevenson's Ethics and Language, you'll find that they both say we owe a great deal to Moore, and they'll both say what Moore did was refute naturalism, and they'll both say what was wrong with Moore was that Moore held that goodness was a real property, whereas it's only a pseudo-property. And in consequence, they said, moral judgments are not real statements. They're neither true nor false. They are merely expressions of emotion or disguised commands or what have you. Well, so much for what I said yesterday. Now, before I go to talk today about uh, my theme, which is the naturalist revival or reaction, I think there are two comments that you might make about what I have said, which I ought to say something about. One is this. Why should Moore not have said 
good is indefinable, but good is nevertheless natural. Notice, all Moore seems to do in his famous argument against the def definability of good is to show that if you try to define good as anything but good, you seem to uh, uh, fall into the difficulty that a question which should be vacuous is not. But suppose you don't try to define good at all, but still say good is a natural property. Good is a property which uh, some natural science might conceivably deal with. What can one say against that? Now, Moore had a reason for rejecting that, though I think he makes it less clear than you might hope in Principia Ethica. It is this. Take any ordinary, simple natural property. The complex ones, of course, won't do here. But let's assume, for example, being round and being tall are simple natural properties. Then notice that two things may differ only in respect of being round or being tall. For example, two cookies might uh, differ from one another simply in that one was round, the other was square. That is, they might be exactly the same quantity of dough in each. They might be uh, of the same dough. They might be cooked exactly the same way. They might have the same everything about them except their shape. One will be round, the other not. Similarly, two rods might be alike in every respect, but one was longer than the other. Now, if good were a simple natural property, as I've supposed being round or being tall to be, then it should be possible for two things to differ in respect of goodness alone. And I think you'll see at once that that is ridiculous. If two things could differ simply in respect of goodness alone, then it would be possible to find two men, both of them equally wise, courageous, temperate, and just, to take the platonic list of virtues, and both uh, identical in other respects, and yet to suppose that although they're equally wise, courageous, temperate, and just, one of them should happen to be good and the other not good. Now, once you think about that, I think you'll see quite immediately that <clears throat> uh, whenever things differ in respect of goodness, they differ because they differ in certain other properties in virtue of which they are good. If one man differs from another in respect of goodness, there must be some characteristic, such as courage or temperance or justice or what have you, in virtue of which uh, he is good and the other not good. In short, you might say goodness cannot be a simple natural property because if you take simple natural properties, things may differ in respect of them alone, whereas things differ in respect of goodness always in virtue of something else. You are always good in virtue of being something uh, and the something that you're good in virtue of being will be a natural property. Now, this was recognized after Moore very clearly by nearly all Moore's intuitionist followers. W.D. Ross, in his book, The Right and the Good, says good is a toti resultant property, meaning it results from the whole of the other properties a thing has. And um, R.M. Hare, in his language of morals, who's of course, a, rad a radical follower of good, uh, of Moore, um, a sort of uh, post-logical positivist, says good is what he calls a supervenient property, by which it, he means it supervenes upon natural properties. So, good cannot be a simple natural property. It's a supervenient or totai resultant property, which, as it were, arises out of natural properties. Now, that, of course, is one reason why Moore was inclined to think that goodness is not part of the description of a thing. See, Moore thought, once you've given an account of the things in virtue of which a man is good, you don't add anything when you add, and he's good. Well, if that's the case, if you can't identify good with uh, a simple natural property, then you might ask, well, why not simply accept 
the logical positivist conclusion. If good uh, turns out not to be uh, a part of the description of anything, if it can't be a natural property, then why not just follow the logical positivist and say good is simply a pseudo property and moral judgments just not proper judgments, not propositions, not true or false. Now it's curious that Moore himself, before his, uh, uh, even in his own thinking, he got to the conclusion that good could never be part of the description of anything, had actually refuted the view that moral judgments are not uh, propositions. I should add that he didn't himself, in the course of his life, stick by his refutation without wavering. When C.L. Stevenson argued against his refutation, he said Stevenson might perhaps be right, although according to other records, he retracted that concession later. But Moore's argument is a simple one, and you might care to know it. And it's just this. If one man makes the judgment an action is good or right, and another that the action is not good or right. Then, if the logical positivist view were true, all that would be happening would be that they were issuing conflicting commands or issuing uh, different emotive noises with respect to the thing. It would be as though one was saying hurrah for that, and the other was saying boo to that. Now, Differing, uh, conflicting commands and uh, differing emotive noises, of course, are not uh, propositions. In consequence, you don't say either of them is true or false. But notice, if one man says an action is good and the other says it's bad, by all the ordinary uh, rules of logic, they have produced two contradictory utterances. And contradictory utterances are propositions, and uh, they're propositions, of course, which are such that both cannot be true, and one at least must be true. As soon as you admit that uh, X is good and X is not good are logical contradictories, you've got to accept that they are propositions, that they are true or false. Now, of course, you can say it doesn't follow they really are propositions. This might be just an appearance. So it might. But if you're going to write it off as an appearance, you've got to explain why it is that our language should choose, or people in the developing our language should have chosen a propositional form in which to express moral judgments. Certainly one can say, to the extent that language is any sort of guide at all to uh, people's deeper convictions on this matter, then language indicates that people think of moral judgments as being true or false. And uh, one, presumably, especially a logical positivist, would not lightly abandon this uh, deep-seated uh, indication in language. Well, Moore can put it then this way. To the extent that uh, our very language for expressing moral judgments is not radically mistaken, moral judgments are true or false. They are propositional. In that case, the logical positivist theory, according to which they are not propositional, cannot possibly be true. And so you might say, we have a complete deadlock. On the one hand, we've got Moore showing that old-style naturalism, the defining of terms like good in itself, in terms of natural properties, uh, is inadmissible. And we've got that the natural conclusion from that would be that <clears throat> uh, good is, after all, something which can't even form part of the description of anything, is, in fact, a pseudo-property. And that's the line of thought which Moore and his logical positivist followers tended to take. But then, on the other hand, we seem to have a strong argument to the effect that moral judgments are propositional, that they are true or false. Well, how can we get out of that deadlock? Now, one way to get out of it would be, I suppose, to reject Moore totally. And, of course, to reject Brentano totally. Remember, I argued last time that Moore and Brentano in these matters stood together. 
And if one did that, one would reject virtually the whole 20th century ethical tradition, and some people might say, no bad thing either. Now, <clears throat> I wouldn't myself go as far as that, <clears throat> but still, I want to put it for, um, before you that that's a possible thing to do. I want, in fact, to suggest that very much of Moore's and Brentano's work ought to be accepted, and I'll list what I think ought to be accepted. I think, first of all, one ought to accept the more Brentano view that what is or is not good in itself is independent of what is or what does or does not exist. That is, I don't think the fact that anything exists can make something uh, good in its kind, which wouldn't have been good in its kind if something didn't exist. So you can say the separation of ethical from metaphysical questions in this way, I think, is a valid point in the more Brentano tradition. The second uh, valid point, I think, that you can isolate in the more Brentano tradition is the doctrine that many different kinds of thing may be good in themselves. So there's not just one thing that is good in itself. A third thing, very tentatively, I'd say one can accept, is that good in itself is an objective property, but that, I think, is going to turn out to be somewhat ambiguous. Firstly, I think we can accept Moore's special contribution, the principle of organic unities, which I won't uh, explain again because it's not going to form any part of the rest of this discussion. So I think myself there are four things, at least in the Moore Brentano tradition, which I, I would not lightly abandon. The question is, how can one get out of the deadlock and hold on to those four things? Well, I suggest the obvious place uh, to get out of the deadlock is to break with Moore's doctrine that good, or if you like, in Brentano's case, right, is indefinable. To break the doctrine that there are certain special, reserved, indefinable ethical terms. However, in attempting to define it, it obviously won't do to go back with the old naturalists and produce some natural property which one identified with good. And this, by the way, is an indication of how even false philosophical theories, I think, contribute to progress. I think, in some sense, naturalism is true. But I certainly don't think that it's true in the form in which Moore refuted it. And Moore's doctrine that good is indefinable at least was better than the, uh, was an advance upon the doctrine it replaced that good can be defined in terms of natural properties. Well, okay, <clears throat> we've got to define good, but not define it as any natural property. And you might add, for good measure, we've got to define it in such a way that what Ross called its totai resultant character and what Hare called its supervenience is safeguarded. Now, is this possible? Now, I'm not here um, speaking as an historian of ethics, but as far as I know, the first uh, recent writer to offer a correct solution of this problem was Stephen Toulmin in an occasionally brilliant, but sometimes, I think, dreary and thoroughly perverse book, uh, An Examination of the Place of Reason in Ethics. But I think what Toulmin says on the subject of defining good uh, was a genuine and important breakthrough. I'm quite sure that some um, good toiler is now going to find that there were geniuses for two or three hundred years before Toulmin who got exactly his idea. But all I want to say is that for purposes of contemporary ethics, I think Toulmin was uh, the first man to give what I take to be a correct solution here. And even though nothing else in his book is correct, perhaps, this ought to be said to his very great honor. Now, what Toulmin began with was Moore's doctrine that moral statements, moral judgments, contradict each other. And he asked himself, what do moral judgments need if they're to be contradictories, except uh, supposing that there is or is not uh, an objective property belonging to the thing in question. And he produced this statement. It's on page 28 of his examination of the place of reason in ethics. All the two people need to contradict one another about, in the case of ethical predicates, are reasons for doing this 
rather than that or the other. Now, uh, that's not a terribly clear way of putting it. Um, let me say what I think he's saying. I think he's saying when two people say so-and-so is good, so-and-so is not good, you can take the first one to be saying something like there are reasons for doing so-and-so, and the other one is saying there are not reasons for doing so-and-so. And so he's saying you may define x is good as there are reasons for doing x. This is where x is an action. Now, this definition won't do as it stands. Because, of course, you can offer reasons in support of doing a certain action, and someone else may offer reasons against it without contradicting one another. There's no contradiction at all in saying there are reasons both for and against doing something. You only contradict each other if you add something further, namely that your reasons are adequate or conclusive, and if the other denies that. So if we correct Tillman's definition, we get this. You can define the statement X is good in itself as applied to actions as meaning the reasons for doing X for its own sake and not as a means to anything else are conclusive. Now, it may seem that's not uh, a definition that should uh, be very exciting. In a way, as you think about it, isn't it quite obvious? Well, all I can say is Moore didn't see it, Broad didn't see it, as far as I know, nobody saw it. Um, in the 45 years after Principia Ethica was written, until Tuman saw it. Now notice, you can defend Tuman's definition by two very strong considerations. Notice, it passes the test that it does show that statements of the form X is good, X is not good, are real contradictories. Secondly, it enables us to explain why it is that nothing is good except in virtue of something else. It enables us to explain, if you like, the supervenience or the total resultant character of good. See, when you say X is good in itself means there are reasons for bringing X about or for doing X which are conclusive, you are saying, of course, the goodness of X is a matter of the reasons there are for bringing it about. And these reasons, of course, will be reasons founded upon the natural qualities of X. Thus, for example, you might say, uh, to take the hackneyed case, uh, for X to give Y some money is good. This would mean there are conclusive reasons for X to give Y a certain sum of money. Suppose the conclusive reason is um, X owes Y the money, this is the date for repaying it, X can afford to repay it. Then one can say, uh, that in virtue of which that action is good are simply these three facts, the three natural properties, that uh, uh, X owes the money to Y, that this is the date for repayment, and he can repay it. So you can say the goodness of this act is supervenient upon, is in virtue of these natural properties. I've taken it deliberately hackneyed case, but you can uh, see how this would apply to all cases. Uh, I think that um, once you put it like that, <coughs> uh, you can see again why it is that Moore is inclined to say goodness is not, um, uh, is not part of the description of a thing. Because, of course, one's inclined to say the goodness of the act of giving someone a certain amount of money is nothing over and above the fact that you owed the money, that this was the time to repay it and that you could repay it. Uh, the goodness of the act simply consists in those facts about it. However, I think it also enables us to correct Moore's statement that uh, good is not a descriptive term. It is, I think, true that if you describe an action as possessing all the properties in virtue of which it is good, then you don't add anything by adding, and it's also good. The goodness simply is the possessing of those properties. But, <clears throat> uh, and to illustrate it, if you say of a boy scout, today he courageously to rescued two schoolfellows from drowning, you don't add anything by saying, and his deed was good. You've already given the goodness, 
by saying it was a matter of a courageous rescue and so on. On the other hand, if I say of the Boy Scout, he did a good deed today, I certainly have described a deed he did, though I've described it very vaguely. The point is, the class of good deeds is very much larger than the class of, say, courageous rescuings from drowning. So I'd say myself that good is a descriptive term, though you don't add anything to a description when you add, and it was good, to a full account of the natural properties in virtue of which an act is good. Now, <clears throat> I should add at this point that I've given an extremely um, sketchy and partial account of Toulmin's analysis. I've simply confined uh, myself to Toulmin's account of what you mean when you say of an action that it is good. And I've uh, suggested that there are actions which are good in themselves and not merely as a means which might be disputed. However, I've confined myself to that because I think that uh, the rest, elaborating the account so it uh, becomes more general, is simply a matter of ingenuity and patience. I think, although uh, the account is given is much too simple to, to work in the complex cases it's got to work for, uh, you can extend this account so it will work in all the cases. If anyone wants to ask me some problems about this afterwards, I'd be quite happy to go into that. But I think I just say here, that's just technique. But <clears throat> there's a worse thing about Toulmin's account than its uh, incompleteness. It leads, I think, straight to a very difficult question, which Toulmin's whole book does nothing at all to answer. That question is this. Toulmin suggests that there simply are properties in virtue of which we can call something an action good or not good. But <clears throat> how does he know? What is the basis for that statement? And I think one can bring out uh, the difficulty by referring to another well-known recent writer. This is J. O. Ohmson, who wrote uh, a quite well-known essay called On Grading. It first appeared in Mind in 1950, that's been reprinted in various anthologies of ethics since. Now, Ernson was determined to take the shine out of the non-natural property good, and he did it by saying good struck him as being very like labels people use for grading fruit and the like. He said if you take the grading of fruit, of course, you don't use the word good very much, and he looked up some board of uh, marketing's guide to the grading of apples he noticed that they had labels like extra fancy and so on. And he said that if you look up what the uh, marketing board say about the grading label extra fancy, you'll find they say whenever an apple has such and such properties, uh, you know, it's suitably hard, suitably grub-free, suitably uh, colored and so on, um, then you can give it the label extra fancy. Now he said extra fancy is used for labeling uh, apples is a specific grading label. It is in fact confined to the grading of apples. If you take good, it isn't a specific grading label, it's a general one. And the difference between a specific and a general grading label is just this. Specific grading labels are used for grading one kind of thing according to one set of criteria. General ones are used for grading different kinds of thing, and you can use different criteria for the different things. But and here's the key of it. Umson said, consider how we come to grade apples. Somebody lays down certain criteria which reflect, or are supposed to reflect, people's market behavior, people's tastes in the market. But there's no compulsion on anybody at all to accept the market judgment. You may, in fact, simply not like apples with the qualities that go to make an apple extra fancy. You may say, in fact, you like green soft apples, uh, a rare one, rather than red reasonably hard ones. Well, who's to say you nay? The mere fact that most people uh, don't like them that way doesn't mean that you are wrong in liking them that way. Now, Ernst just suggests this. If you take the general grading label good as it's used in morals, 
It seemed to him, he said, that all this means is that in society there are certain criteria in terms of which actions are commonly judged, just as there are in uh, the practice of marketing apples, certain criteria in terms of which apples are commonly judged. But these are just the social criteria. And just as you may differ from uh, uh, the market uh, criteria for apples, so you can differ from the social criteria for actions. Now, what does Truman say about that? Truman talks about there being adequate reasons for doing one act rather than another, and talking about it being that in virtue of which an action is good. But who lays down the adequate reasons? Now, Olmsen, I should add here, um, doesn't want to be too much of a moral skeptic, and he suggests a way of getting out of this. He suggests that when people engage in moral discourse, they implicitly or explicitly presuppose what Ernst calls a standard of enlightenment. And so Ernst says, what you're really doing when you dispute with someone about whether something is morally good or bad is <clears throat> you uh, are saying this thing ought to be done according to the criteria which an enlightened person would accept. But then, Ermsen said, that unfortunately doesn't quite work, because enlightened and unenlightened in turn turn out to be grading labels. How do you grade people according to enlightenment? And Ermsen then says this, if people do not have agreed criteria for enlightenment, I do not know what one can do about it. All cooperative activities, all uses of language, must start from some agreed point. One needs a fixed point to move the world with one's lever. And so we seem to come down to this, that Moore, who wanted something objective, independent of what anybody thought, is going to be replaced by Toulmin. We seem that we're going to be uh, falling back on the notion that somewhere ethics is going to rest on human agreement or convention perhaps conventions about enlightenment, perhaps about something else. But now notice, once you say that, we run up against Moore's own criticism. If two people differ about whether a thing is good or bad, and they have a different criteria of enlightenment, then they're not really disagreeing with one another. If I say, for example, being a Muslim, so-and-so say, uh, having a fourth wife would be a good thing. It uh, uh, fits the criteria which are regarded as enlightened in Muslim society. And you, being a Christian, say, no, having more than one wife is not a good thing because it does not fit with the uh, ideas of light enlightenment that are current in Christian society. You'll notice we haven't as such disagreed. We both agree that Muslim society makes four wives permissible, and Christian society makes four wives impermissible. But if we come up to the question, how do we choose between Muslim and Christian, standards of enlightenment, nothing is offered us. So you might say, the upshot of the Ernst line of thought is moral skepticism, and it's going to be not merely moral skepticism, but abandoning in the end the notion that moral judgments can possibly be true or false, because according to Ernst, they all ultimately rest on relative standards of enlightenment. Now, the last point I want to talk about today is this just general question. Can a naturalist escape the sort of skepticism Ernst gets us into? That, I think, is the fundamental question of contemporary ethics. Now, all I want to say for the rest of this, my time is first, after mentioning a few books in which answers to this question are offered, uh, there are three which I think are rather good, and to mention that there's a great deal of this, uh, of this on this topic in uh, the contemporary literature, I want to outline just what I think uh, might be something a naturalist might say. Now, there are three books, I think, each of which has contributed something uh, significant here, which are all worth looking at. The first is one by Kurt Beyer, who is now at Pittsburgh, the book is called The Moral Point of View, 
and it was published by the Cornell Press, I think, about 1958. Um, <coughs> 57 or 58, I've forgotten exactly which. The second is uh, Brand Blanchard of Yale's uh, book, Reason and Goodness, which was published about 1960. And the most recent is a book by a man at Wisconsin called Marcus Singer, and it's called Generalization in Ethics. Now, each of these books uh, is quite distinctively different in flavor and emphasizes a point not emphasized by the others. Bayer emphasizes very much the notion that there are things that are for your own good, which is irrational not to take account of. Blanchard emphasizes what he calls the rational temper in making choices and thinks that study of the concept of the rational temper will uh, get over Umson's difficulties about enlightenment. And Singer proposes a return to a sort of purged version of Kant's doctrine. Now, I think that all of these books, all three, have something in them that is fundamentally right, and all of them underrate certain other things which are fundamentally right. Uh, and I'm quite sure that what I say, which is goes far more sketchy than what anything they say, is going to be even worse than what they say. But I would just want to emphasize that um, there is a lot of stuff coming out on this at the moment, and I just want to sketch what I think are some of the main outlines of the true answer. Now, the first thing I would want to say is this, that in attempting to find uh, reasons which are objectively valid for choosing one sort of action rather than another, you must begin with a conception of what is your own good. By your own good, I mean for any man, for some conception of what is good for him, what is a good state for him to be in. And this, of course, is where the classical Greek ethics began. This is what, uh, let's say, Aristotle talks about almost nothing but. But still, it is right, this is where ethics must begin. And I'd suggest to you, if you want to look at the classical people on this, that Spinoza says some admirable things, uh, admirable earthy things on this subject, which even Aristotle was inclined to underrate a bit. Now, if you ask, if we're going to start by establishing what is good for me or what is one's own good, where does one start? Now, one standard place to begin, and this is where Bayer begins, is with the notion of pain. And Bayer just says, other things being equal, being in a state of pain is just plainly being in a bad state. And Bayer has lots of, I think, rather good examples to show that it's an absolute paradigm of irrationality to cause yourself pain for no reason, except that it is pain. Uh, I think just to think of this for a little and you'll see it so. I mean, if you find someone doing something, um, you know, uh, doing poker work on one of his feet with a uh, red hot object, and you ask him why he's doing that, if he says, oh, because it hurts, you rush for the doctor, and I mean the head doctor, not the other sort. I mean, this is a standard sort of utterly, evidently irrational behavior. But I think that to begin with pleasure and pain is a mistake in a very important sense, in that <clears throat> uh, it's quite obvious that uh, we accept a great deal of pain in the course of our lives, as we would say, for our own good. Uh, pain is certainly not something that by itself is an ultimate thing which we avoid. It's, you know, in itself not a good thing to have, but certainly uh, a man doesn't govern his life by wondering how to avoid pain. And as Aristotle and Spinoza held, I think, the fundamental concept that is concerned when you deal with the notion of your own good is the notion of yourself as a well-functioning uh, body and a well-functioning mind. Now, I want to emphasize that by well and ill-functioning, I do not mean anything moral. I'm just saying a man is clearly not in a well-functioning bodily state if he has a broken arm and he's not in a well-functioning mental state if he has an obsession or neurosis. However, I would of course agree that our notion of the functioning of the human body and of the human mind are both inadequate. All I would say is we have enough knowledge of the functioning of the body and the mind to 
to be able to say quite conclusively that certain things are not states of well-functioning and others are, as compared with other states, states of well-functioning. The notion of uh, a clear notion of the perfect functioning of a human being I do not think is necessary here. Uh, the more complete a notion we have of well-functioning, the better. But I want to say I think that we can have a non-moral notion of what it is to be in a well-functioning state, um, which is enough to get on with, though incomplete and always being added to. I think, for example, that uh, this is one thing that existentialist ethics is indirectly doing that's important, namely extending our notion of what it is to have a well-functioning psyche. Well, now, I would suggest then, as a first principle for a naturalist ethics, this that the fact that something contributes to your well-functioning, whether of mind or body, is a reason, though not necessarily a conclusive one, for bringing that something about. I'd say if one can't accept that, at least, then I don't see how a naturalist ethic can even begin to be constructed. However, I think this principle is one which is very difficult to reject. If a man says, I don't admit it's a reason, remember, I'm not saying a conclusive reason, but I don't admit it's even a consideration worth taking into account that something contributes to my well-functioning. And here we accept that he agrees with you about what well-functioning is, remembering well-functioning is not an ethical notion by itself. Then all I can say is, um, I'd be utterly baffled at what he even meant by a reason for doing anything. I begin to think he didn't have any idea of what a reason for doing something was. It's quite obvious that that by itself doesn't even give you anything you call moral. It gives you, at best, a rather low-grade uh, rule of thumb for egoistic action. And it's something, but it's certainly not enough to carry on with. Now, can we go any further? Now, <clears throat> I think that we can only go further by taking a step in which um, a number of classical philosophers, especially Kant, studied, and which everybody has found very puzzling for a long time. And this is the notion <clears throat> of looking at yourself and your functioning and deciding that <clears throat> uh, you are a being which uh, is just worth preserving for its own sake. That is, <clears throat> it's a matter of considering yourself as, as Kant would put it, a genuine end. Now, I just want to explain very briefly this, and I'm sure some of you know the idea already, but I just want to pick out what are, I think, the key features here. I'm not saying you've got yourself to tend to follow your own good. In fact, we can leave it to nature that most of us will tend to follow our own good. That goes without saying. Animals just do that sort of thing. I mean, it's a matter of reflecting on what we are and making the decision that we will regard ourselves as genuinely ends. Now, <clears throat> The question is, is this decision an arbitrary one? Obviously, one can contemplate oneself and say, no, I don't think I ought to be round or beings like me ought to be round. I, in fact, shall opt to commit suicide. And this can be done. And so, in one sense, obviously, it's possible for a man to reject his own existence as any kind of valid end. This, I suppose, is something that the existentialists are much perturbed about or much concerned with. Yet, of course, if you take the Kantian tradition, Kant would argue that <clears throat> the existence of a rational being, and he thought of uh, a man being primarily a rational being, the existence of a rational being was simply self-evidently an end in itself something worth preserving and maintaining. 
Now, all I would say here is this, that I don't think you can get a naturalist ethic on its legs unless you're prepared to say something very like what Kant said about this, that you will regard the uh, existence and the maintenance of beings like yourself, i.e. rational animals, as uh, an end in itself. Now, if you do this, <clears throat> you'll notice that you at once go beyond the egoistic point of view of acting for your own good, because you're recognizing yourself as being something worthy of respect in virtue of being rational, of being a rational animal, of being a man. And once you say that, of course, you oblige yourself to respect the being of other men, who after all have exactly the same claim as you to respect. In this matter, they're identical with you. So, we'll go this way. I think the second principle of reason in a naturalist ethic will have to be a principle of what I like to call equity, which is something of this kind, that <clears throat> since you regard your own good as something which it is rational to pursue because you are the kind of being you are, namely a man, therefore you must respect the right of other men to pursue their good, and you mustn't uh, interfere with other men's good. That is, you mustn't uh, make use of other men uh, simply as means to your own good. You realize I've plumped this formula out, and I'm sure you've recognized little snippets of it from Kant and other people. I don't want to, again, uh, at this point, elaborate on the details here. I want just to talk first about where you'd go from these two principles, and secondly, what you can say against, say, Ernsonian criticisms of them. Now, first of all, I want to say that once you've got a notion of human well-functioning and a principle of equity, I think the way is open for the fullest and most sensitive exploration both of a kind of objective moral code governing what you may not do to others, if you like, the rights of others against yourself or your duties towards others. But secondly, you've got the way open for exploring what's after all the important thing. This is the pursuit of your own happiness. I think that ethics has been much too much concerned with the notion of uh, repaying debts and avoiding picking other people's pockets and not nearly enough with the notion of what is a good state of life to be in. And I think that uh, this is one respect in which post-Kantian ethics has been particularly deplorable. If you look at the great ethical classics before Kant, especially if you look at, I think, one of the greatest, this is Spinoza's, you find that he's concerned with just nothing but this question. Uh, how can I achieve a completely free and a completely active state of life. And this is something addressed to the individuals who read him. Spinoza didn't think you could achieve this for other people. Everyone had to do it for himself. And I think that although Nietzsche, say, is a very tormented and perverse writer in some ways, partly because he could never allow for what was true and right in the Kantian tradition, but in his perverse way, Nietzsche is trying to say the same thing that in the end, living uh, a good life is something which every man has got to do for himself, and therefore moralists ought to concern themselves to quite a large extent with just exploring um, what a good life for an individual is, and setting before an individual some sort of ideal, what he can do for himself, uh, of course, and what he must respect other people for doing. So I would say that if you've got, um, 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 if you start just with these, these two fundamental ideas, the notion of further exploring the well-functioning of a human being, the notion of a human being as a rational being being something worthy of respect as an end, which leads to some sort of principle of equity, of, if you like, of non-interference, of non-making use of other beings for your ends, then I think one can give 
a very full, strong content to Toulmin's notion of a reason for doing something rather than something else, and also of an adequate reason for doing something rather than something else. But, of course, Holmesson will come back. Surely, he would say, uh, it just comes out of what you've said, that what you've done is produce a kind of eclectic uh, uh, system, which is uh, pretty enough, perhaps, but you've taken a little bit out of Spinoza, a little bit out of Kant, and you've mixed a porridge, and you set it before us. But why should we respect these two principles which you've uh, mentioned, the principle that your own good is to be understood in terms of self-functioning, uh, of well-functioning, and it is always uh, a good reason for doing something uh, that is for your own good, and secondly, your principle of equity. Now here I just want to say a couple of dogmatic things because I'm sure if you ever get in a bull session on ethics, this is the point you usually start at and never get off. The first point is this. <clears throat> There's always a temptation to define yourself right. That is to say, by giving reasons, I mean appealing to my own good and appealing to equity. And all one can say about that is that that is uh, a way of doing things which cheats right at the beginning and doesn't help. You've got to suppose here somebody who doesn't value himself, perhaps, or somebody who doesn't see uh, why he should uh, respect uh, beings just because they're of a certain kind. And here, I think all I want to say is <coughs> that the best thing is just to be um, um, simply straight candid about it. Yes, I'm suggesting these two principles are ultimate. I, of course, perceive that you could so use the word reason that appealing to these two principles wouldn't be, in your terms, a good reason. Yes, I can see that people can commit suicide and people can refuse to respect themselves or anybody. They can just act like bandits. But I want to say I don't think either of these things in a way matters. I think all that's important is just to put before people what the ultimate ethical reasons are and uh, to say that's what they are. It seems to me, if somebody says quite seriously, I don't care about my own good, I don't care about my well-functioning, or if someone says quite seriously, I don't respect myself as an end, I may happen perhaps to look after myself, but that's not because I uh, respect myself and I don't respect anybody else either. Well, literally, there's nothing you can do about him. I'm inclined to say he's a man who hasn't grasped uh, um, what it is to have a rational approach to life. I'd say he's a man who hasn't grasped the value of his own existence, all sorts of things. So you can, the rhetoric is easy to provide. But I'm just inclined to say here it's important to be flat honest. I think that the two fundamental principles I've mentioned are in fact principles which virtually everybody does recognize. I don't mean we always act by them. I think not merely that. I think they're principles that are such that the more you reflect on them, the uh, solider they seem to be. And I think also they have the great advantage that um, they do not lead to any simple endorsement of contemporary respectability. That is, if you seriously try to work out their consequences, I think you're apt to find, as Spinoza and Kant and Nietzsche all did in different ways, that they lead to extremely unorthodox and, um, you know, in certain respects, uh, and uh, interesting results. So this, I think, is all I'd want to say. If you ask me why I call this lecture the revival of naturalism, we're talking, I suppose, in biological metaphors here, I'd simply say this is what I think contemporary ethics is now worrying about. I don't mean my particular version of these principles, but I think people are now worrying about the notion of what it is to give a reason in ethics, and I think they're worrying about this in terms of what are the natural properties in virtue of which an action is good or bad. Thank you.